Thank you, strange, slightly menacing tune. This week on Matt Chat, I'm going to be speaking to a man, world-renowned monster hunter, Steve Feltham, who gave up everything in his life, basically, house, job, girlfriend, the lot, bought himself a mobile library, and headed off to the Highlands of Scotland to chase his dreams of solving the mystery of Loch Ness and potentially the mystery of the Loch Ness Monster. Um, a really good in- interview. I really enjoyed this interview with Steve. And um, I have to apologise. The audio isn't great on my end. Steve sounds okay, but I don't know what went wrong with my audio but <laughs> I'm going to try and fix it but there's not a lot I can do about it here so hopefully you'll enjoy the interview and um, this is Steve Feltham Right in 1991 my next guest gave up everything sold his house gave up his well-paid job and all to follow his dreams of uh finding the Loch Ness monster welcome steve feltham how are you steve hi there matt yeah i'm very good actually yeah well it has yeah how's things in the highlands at the moment like, with everything that's going on is is it being hit is everything closed down out there or absolutely yeah we are really really shutting everything down even the car park on the beach here at doors that i live in we've locked the car park i'm not selling the nessie models outside anymore basically no. we, all of the businesses in the highlands are trying to stop this refugee situation yeah. of the camp camper vans from down south that think it's a safer place to be up here and oh is that what's, that what's happening everybody's coming up there because they assume low, that the virus isn't yeah. going to be there well, they do, but they don't realise that the whole of the Highlands, from Aviemore to John O'Groats, there's three, uh, 30 ventilators, and there's, I don't know, what, 100,000 people. So it ain't a good place to get ill. No. So, yeah, we're really just sort of trying to get a message out there that this is not a sense it might you might feel like you'll be remote and away from it but if you get anything we haven't got the health service up here no, to yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm very familiar with the area so the pub there that's closed is it where you where you are the doors in yeah yeah closed locked down uh, the gates locked everything yeah and yeah. all the hotels around is there anything open like for anywhere to, no one so just so when they're coming up in the camper vans they've got nowhere to stay but they're still coming anyway yeah, that seems to be the situation at the moment. Yeah, well, wow. so they're talking about potentially closing the campsites. I don't. I think most of them are closed voluntarily, but yeah, yeah, yeah a few of them. Because we were supposed to be coming up later in the year, so I'm waiting to hear about that. But that was that was uh, up in there. Um, some yeah. holiday. Yeah. Anyway, I really don't want people moving about up here. Really, no, no absolutely not. No, mm. everybody's got to stay safe. They can't stop moving about down here. I'm in Essex and uh, people are just, the queues outside the supermarkets every morning is horrendous. They've got no idea. They're all, you've probably seen it online. They're all kind of like right yeah. next to each other. They're crazy people. Anyway, let's move on. Let's try and yeah. talk about some happy things. <laughs> Bad times. Okay, so your story. Um, so I need to ask, when did you first know that this is what, this is what you wanted to do with your life. Like, was you a very young child or kind of a teenager? What? Well, I, I certainly fell in love with the mystery when I was seven, when I oh. came here, first time I came here. And just the whole possibility of what I believed then to be dinosaurs swimming about in a Scottish loch, that was yeah. enough for me. And all through my childhood, I had this great passion for the subject and anything I could get on it, I was reading about it and... You know, when you had to give a 10 minute classroom talk on your favorite subject. Well, it was yeah. always it was always this subject that I'd pull out the old photographs and stuff. And even back then, I remember um, my granddad once when I was a kid saying, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? 
and I could not think that there was a job as a monster hunter. So I would I remember telling him that I'd like to be the lock keeper at Fort Augustus, right. letting, the boat, letting the boats go up through the lock system up there because I know that doing that job you've got a slight view out onto the water of Loch Ness from the canal. So I thought, well, that's the nearest I'll ever get to being full time Nessie hunting. I'd do that job. At yeah. Top of a hand. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice down in Fort Augustus. It wouldn't have been a bad job. You've got a nice view right down the lock from down there as well, right? Lovely job, yeah. yeah. The other end from where you are. You like so you're on the Doors Beach, aren't you? Yeah. I mean yeah. you've got a stunning view where you are. I was I was Absolutely. um I was there now. in October. Sorry? Oh, okay. I'm looking at it now, I'm looking straight down the length of the loch. Yeah, there's snow on the peaks. Oh, is there? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. perfect. So um I remember the um, the documentary that you did, uh, Desperate, Desperately Seeking Nessie, right? That's right, yeah. Filmed the yeah. first year, really. Yeah, that was, uh, I think that's possibly the thing that made me, made my situation capable of being full, you know, going on for years. And yeah. That put me in the guy. If I'd have remained yeah. anonymous, then I'd have just been an anonymous bloke in a van that never seemed to go <laughs> Which, uh, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, I remember. And it was, yeah, when I did it, even, you know, video diaries, they were the first, the BBC series was the first series that put camcorders in the hands of the general public and then broadcast it. So oh, wow. you know, it was a brand new discipline back then. You know, now half of the television programs are totally made on camcorders. But yeah, back so, then it, so you filmed the whole thing, did you, yourself? Yeah, everything, everything. Yeah. Oh, wow. And then when they there's a film crew following him around. I'm thinking, like, because no, no. I saw no, you had like the Japanese uh, press and that yeah. hounding you and all that kind of thing on there. But I thought there's probably a BBC crew following him around and it's drawing attention to everybody. But you just had the one camera in you, yeah. I had my own camera, and it was only by luck that I ended up speaking to the BBC about which camera to buy. Uh, because it was all different formats back then. And they put me onto the community program unit that had just started using these camcorders. And they said, well, we might be able to do something with you. Can't promise anything, but, you know, and I ended up going up to North Acton for a meeting with the director that I ended up working with. And he said, yeah, we can, what we can do is we can give you box after box of videotape. You just keep filling them up for the next year. Don't worry about how many you use. The more, the better. Send them back to us. And, you know, we can't promise that we'll make a program at the end, but we might be able to if you get some good, you know, stuff. So yeah. that's what I did. Um, when, when did. When did they show that? Was that like 91 or was that like a bit later? August the 1st, 92, that went out. You know the date, Steve. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> life-changing moment yeah, yeah i didn't absolutely. see it till very very late because like, I, 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 I first took an interest in like kind of late 90s and um i've been sort of going to the area for about 20 years now trying to get yeah. there at least once a year anyway but uh i became like, aware of you once i started i didn't really know anything before but um right. i've got a few models off you and stuff over here my little boy loves them um when i was watching the documentary i, I was always thinking to myself when you was driving up there, you said, it seemed like such a, like, chore. <laughs> you were saying things like, the journey is going to take me two weeks and stuff. <laughs> How fast does that van go? Like, what was, was you just taking, like, lots of back streets and stuff? Or why, why would it take you so long to get there? I followed the coastline of Wales to start with. Oh, right, I, okay. I figured, you know, my van, I'm, I still live in the same van. And yeah. It's an ex-mobile library from Dorchester. And I figured, right, this vehicle is never going back down the country. So this is my one opportunity to have a caravan tour of, well, as I say, the west coast of Wales. And, yeah, but I, when I look back at any clips from that video diary, I, I really can see the stress in me when I set mm -hmm. off. The stress was the thing that, was a, it was a catalyst in making me think what do I really want to do in my life you know that yeah. southern English anger at 
you know, the frustration that, oh, I mean, I've lost my credit cards or whatever. These yeah. little things, I just needed to get out of that crazy rat race. Yeah. And it and it did take me a year or two up here. Luckily, I fell in with a family in the village of Dawes, the McLennans, and Margaret. She's dead now, but she, well, she's in the video diary. She very much took me under her wing, and I showed her a lot of the early footage from that diary whilst I was filming it. And she was saying, "Yeah, yeah, see, I can see all the sort of Southern English rage in you," and <laughs> and. You know, she sat me down with a few bottles of whiskey and over the course of a year or two calmed me down to a different pace of life, which we have yeah. up here, you know, a lot oh, of stress. Absolutely. Is. I, remember, I remember the first time I went up there, I stayed up, the, the, I think I was at the Klansman, and um, yeah. the, I remember I was like obsessively making sure nothing was on show in the car when I locked it and all this kind of, and the guy come out he's like, we don't even lock the cars here. Like, what? <laughs> what are you stressing about? It's the strangest yeah. thing to me. Um, yeah. yeah. But, but on the van, when you like talking about the van that you went up there in, how long were you actually? How many years were you actually mobile in that around the lock, or did you kind of settle pretty quickly to where you are? No, oh, about ten years, really. Oh, really? The first, yeah, the first ten years, and I, I, as soon as I got here, the first week or two, I went round and round the lock got permission off of places like the Doors Inn and the Klansmen and Fort Augustus and places to say, well, I'm not going to be permanently parked in your car park, but I'm going to come and go on a rotor sort of. So is it all right if once every week or two I park in your car park for a night or two? And yeah. they nearly all of them said yes. And so that's what I did for 10 years. And Doors Beach sort of pretty quickly became a base even though i would you know if i had something to fix on the van i would come back to here fix it and then get back out and about again and you know that i was quite happy doing that but it was quite hard i mean this van was made in 1970 so yeah. things would break and so i would have to go around scrapyards all over the country looking for parts and then the millennium came along and the Doors in it used to be on a 10-year lease to different landlords. Oh, and okay. the owner of the building and the beach and the car park, Ian Cameron, he was drawing up the new lease for the new tenant that was going to be coming in. And I did see him come walking down. He came walking down my van one day with a bit of paper in his hand. And I thought, oof, what's he want? And he said, can I have a word with you? Um, drawing up the new lease for the new tenants and I'm thinking about your van down here and I thought oh god this is the big heave ho coming yeah. up and he said what I think I'm going to do is um, for the new lease I'm going to take the bit of land that you're parked here on off of their lease so you, they're not renting this bit of land just in case you want to make a patio or decking or anything you haven't then got to get their permission you've got my blessing to spread out if you want and you know believe me i knew then that i was never going to get an offer like that from anybody else uh -huh. and never in such a fantastic location and so yeah of course i straight away unbolted the steering wheel and <laughs> that was me I, i'm you know no intention of coming out of here I've, no you, you got it pretty so you've got a piano in there right i've taken the piano out now i took oh, it out you have? temporarily yeah, we had a bit of a party here one weekend and we needed to, I needed to make a dance floor in the van. So we took the piano out, me and a mate, to make some space and to get it round the back of the van temporarily in our moving it. We never knew that you can't tip a piano onto one side, onto its lid, then onto the other side, then onto its feet again to get it to go around the corner, <laughs> roll it around the corner. What actually happens when you do that is all the keys fall out. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we sort of killed that piano by accident. And, oh, no. When you, yeah. when you was mobile around the, around the lock, like, where did you, where did you get, like, the best view of the entire, was it around the, is it, the, what do they call it, the south side or uh, the, the, the non, you know, the, the other side, not the A80 to the other side? Like, the, you get yeah. more elevated views over there, don't you? You do. Um, there's, I would say, 
the best views of Loch Ness are either from here, from Dawes Beach, or from the exact opposite end at the mouth of the canal. You know the mouth of the canal at Fort Augustus, that turning yeah. circle there? Well, I used to tuck myself right back in the corner where they've now put a little sign that says Loch Ness, and they put some right. big rocks. Well, I don't know if the rocks are a coincidence or not. Um, um, that's where I used to sit for weeks there, and that's a fantastic view. But what I, what I did work out about the, the um, geography of the landscape that I was looking in, because the mountains are on the west coast of Scotland or halfway across Scotland, the hills start getting a lot bigger. They start turning into mountains. Yeah. So where I sit here at Dawes, I'm looking down 23 miles of loch, but the, the hills are, as they go away, getting bigger. So you're know, looking into a view that's getting grander and grander the further west my view here goes when you look back from fort augustus towards this end towards inverness you're actually in amongst the big hills looking east at the low-lying hills so the the aesthetic of the view is less because you're looking at this view that dwindles to nothing on the horizon you know it's, yeah. so i actually my favourite view is, unsurprisingly, unsurprisingly, the view from Dawes Beach. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. As it's your view. Um, so yeah. with the with the you make these little Nessie models. I do. Yeah. On. So, can, is there anybody? Because obviously no one can go up with them. If anybody was to want to buy one, what could could they do that online at all? Or you're not selling them at the moment, not making them, or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty much the only way at the moment. And you know, all the time I've been here, which is now. 29 years they have been the sole income there's been no other no other yeah. income I'm talking to the occasional media but um, at the yeah. moment i'm not selling any so i'm a bit shot in the foot that way um have you got a website you want to put on so people would know what yeah uh, nessiehunter.co.uk or .com it doesn't matter which they both lead to the same place nessiehunter.com and there's a store on there where you can buy them and I post them out all over the world. And that I think is going to be, I'm going to have to promote that a bit at the moment because that's going to be what keeps me funded to keep sitting here. And yeah, absolutely. And um, as I say, yeah, right. Okay. It's, so, oh, excuse me. I've got, I hope I haven't got the virus. <laughs> I'm not feeling the best. So I'm, I'm going to get onto, um, so what is the, since you've been there, naturally, let's do of all time. So the most convincing piece of evidence you've ever seen from anybody, not seen personally, just seen at all. Uh, I, some of the sonar contacts really impressed me, I think. Uh, yeah. and the one that I am particularly fond of is Marcus Atkinson's one where he, he drives one of the ribs that comes out of Fort Augustus, taking people on hour-long boat trips. And he'd taken this fast rib full of passengers up to Urfit Castle. He'd put all the passengers ashore. They get a little half-hour walk around the castle as part of the, part of the tour. And so he then bobs about in the boat in Urfit Bay, waking, waiting to go back and pick them up, sits on the boat, has a fag or whatever. And he's watching the sonar screen, and he's in 600 feet of water and then on the screen 60 feet below him this big heavy trace of something passes underneath the boat and you know marcus has been driving boats on loch ness for the best part of 20 years and right. using using absolutely state-of-the-art sonar equipment and he knows it he knows what he's looking at and he knows the false alarms and this thing just absolutely dumbfounded if he done he still to this day does not know what in that depth of water it, this object in midwater bigger yeah. than it, bigger than much bigger the, you can't tell the length of an object with a sonar because imagine if you're sat in a boat and the boat is sitting still and a whale comes and sits underneath your boat for 10 minutes that would produce a really long trace but if it passed through and didn't stop underneath the boat, just shot through underneath you, 
all you'd get is a very skinny trace because it's only got a brief reading of the sonar. But what it will accurately tell you is how wide, how deep something is, how wide, you know, the from the width of it from top to bottom. And wow. it was about a meter and a half. This object that passed underneath him, wide, yeah. deep, top to bottom. Wow. So when was when was that? It was about two two thousand and five or two thousand and eight. I forget. Oh now. really? Yeah, yeah. It's not so long ago. No, it's so fairly recent in the, like in the amount of time you've been there, anyway. Yeah, and he's somebody yeah. that I know and trust, and you know that that impresses me. And yeah, one of the other things that is the backbone of why I remain sitting here waiting is yeah. the the reliable local eyewitnesses that I've spoken to hundreds and hundreds over yeah, the years. Yeah, that was what I was going to ask you about. So with, with locals, that were like maybe with tourists, if it, has anybody ever brought you? Like knocked on your van, Steve. I've I've just took this picture. I've just took this video. Can you ever look at it for me? Is any of those ever kind of like? Are usually mainly just kind of like, oh, that's a wave, or that's a bit of driftwood, or? That's that's I, I do now realise that that's sort of part of my job. Really, is to look at these things, and if I can see a, a plausible explanation for it, and believe me, nine out of ten times there is a plausible explanation. The yeah. things, things that I've been shown pictures of that people think is the Loch Ness Monster can be a boat. You can see the boat, you can see, you know, but people make genuine mistakes. But then yeah. occasionally that shows me something and I really can't explain what it is. There was no. a 10 year old girl years ago, or oh, what was her name? Um, Robinson, Charlotte Robinson, something like that. Anyway, she turned up on day one of her holiday, staying on the Invermore campsite. Her parents are in the caravan getting the bags unpacked. She's out playing on the shore, and she's got her mother's iPhone with her, and she saw something in the water and took a photograph of it, went back in and said, oh, Mum, I've just photographed Nessie. And the mother laughed and said, yeah, well, whatever, let's have a look. I went, oh. What's that then? And didn't wow. and it's, a, it's the head of something in the water. It's not the world's greatest picture, but it is very unexplained. So yeah, they went they went and told somebody in Fort Augustus, who then said, "Interesting. Don't know what that is. Best thing to do is go down to Dawes and see Steve and show him." And they brought it to me. I couldn't explain it, so I pushed it on into the public domain so that. All of the Nessie hunters around the world with a part-time interest in this subject can then look at these these pictures, this newest picture, and have something to debate. Have something that yeah. somebody else may have the technology to work out what it is. You know, that's that's sort of I feel duty bound that that's what I should do with anything that I find that I can't explain. Yeah, I mean, it says same. It says something that you can't explain. It. You must have seen thousands of, of yeah. pictures of you. Oh, that's a, I mean do you get seals in there is that is that true yeah, people yeah, say yeah. that you do which is an amazing thing actually seals I've seen several in the loch and when I when a, when a seal's in here I'll generally spot it the boys that are doing the boat at Fort Augustus they're good friends of mine they see them because they're out on the water all the time and they are looking for objects in the water whilst they're going along just for safety of the boat as much as anything else. And they're quite high up. So they'll spot a seal if there's one about. The guys that work on the only fish farm that's in Loch Ness, that's a big lump of bait to a seal. The, yeah. They will see something. And maybe some of the cruise boats that come out of Urca Bay might spot a seal. But you think in the summer, in August, when there's thousands of tourists on the side of the loch with their cameras and videos. And to this day... No tourist has come up to me and said, oh, here's your explanation. Here's your, here's what you is. I'll just photograph this seal. And we know that a seal is an inquisitive animal, and yet tourists fail to spot them. And even when we, the rest of us, know here, people don't spot them. So, you know, what chance an elusive creature <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So on to you. 
So yeah. what, what have, have you seen anything convincing with your own eyes yourself? One, one thing in the first year, uh, I was mobile then, and I was parked at the mouth of the canal at Fort Augustus, looking across the ca- canal into that bay, which is, I think it's Ballham Bay, they call that one, uh, behind the monastery, behind the abbey. And something just shot through a, a sort of angle for less than 10 seconds. The waves must have been about a foot and a half high. And this thing went against the waves. All you could see, all I could see was a white streak going through the water, like a torpedo had gone through there. Or sometimes I compare it to like, as if you almost, not quite as big as if you imagine a jet ski, the spray off of a jet ski without the jet ski. Yeah. You know? So it's something pretty substantial just at the surface. But with the, me being at water level, looking across at it, I couldn't see what the object was. I could only see the spray coming off of this thing and we haven't got fish in here that explains that to me right. so but uh, you know it, that lasted for a couple of seconds and i you know being a novice back then year one froze and as soon as it finished as soon as it subsided that's when i thought damn it you know i'm oh, that's, <laughs> that's my job i'm supposed to have fo- photographed that Right, next time it happens, I'll photograph it. And here we are. I'm still waiting for that next glimpse like that. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So you, you, am I right in saying that you're in the Guinness Book of Records? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are. <laughs> what did they give you that for? How long was that for? Uh, I'm the world champion at not being able to find anything. No, it's... it's <laughs> the wall here behind me it is... Guinness World Record Certificate for the longest continuous vigil seeking the Loch Ness Monster, it says, is 21 years. So it's an old world record, but it's ongoing. Achieved by Steve Feltham, Loch Ness, since right. June well, 19th. They, they should be updating that every year. You should have a wall full of them now, shouldn't you? And another no. year, and another year, and another year. You have no room. Yeah. Well, um, they, they contacted me about that, and they said... Uh, we think you've got the world record for the longest continuous vigil. And I said, well, I'm not, not entirely sure I have, you know, there's people that are born and bred that live on the side of this lot. They said, well, we think it's you. Uh, And they said, and so we're thinking of giving you the world record. And if you do decide to agree with us, you, all you need to do to get this world record is send us some proof of the date you were wrong. Some proof still there and i thought well i'm not doing that um so i left it didn't didn't send them any details whatsoever and about six months later the bbc some children's program from the bbc which is officially amazing i think it was called and they emailed me and said do you mind if we come and interview you about your world record and i said I don't think you'll find I've got one. And they said, I think you'll find you have. We'll send you a, a photograph of page 155 of the Guinness Book of Record books and you'll see that you've got one. So it was a bit of a surprise to me to find that the Guinness Book of Records had gone on and given it to me without me actually. So, yeah, as I say, it was un, it was unrequested on my part. But, yes, I do have it. Well, yeah, Jim. Yeah, world champion, so, world you know, champion sitting on a beach. Yes, looking vaguely <laughs> Just to backtrack a second, I've just, I've something I've always wanted to ask you. With the, um, what are your views on the the Tim Dinsdale film? Because I everyone used to swear that was the uh, the holy grail of evidence. Um, yeah. It's a bit grainy and a bit dark. Uh, it wasn't he in a, a hotel over in Foyers, was it? Is that am I right? Before you yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it impresses me. It looks impressive. It's something in the water there. And obviously, Jarek looked at it and said, That is probably, probably animate. Yes. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it suffered from the relentless investigation of Adrian Shine, who yes. is, a friend, is a friend of mine. And, um, but he is has become quite sceptical about evidence and he does get very excited about 
disproving any strand of the evidence. Right. He, he's done a lot of work where he says he can identify a bloke sat in the back of a boat. So right. I remember one day he invited, this was um, uh, probably a landmark day for me in Nessie Hunted. Uh, Adrian invited myself, Rip, Rip Heppel, who's an age-old monster hunter, um, Alistair Boyd, another one, and Richard Carter, somebody else as well, round to the Drumner Drocket exhibition for a day of discussion about the evidence, the, the five or six of us in a room, I'm in an hour in about this and that. And in there, I, I think the whole object of the exercise was for Adrian to unleash his latest findings about the Dinsdale film. Yeah. And I, I, I do remember that myself and Rip Heppel were not having it at all. Yeah, you know, we could, no matter how many times he rewound the film and showed us again, we couldn't see the bloke in the ba- in the boat back of the boat. And there was no way we were gonna see, gonna see the bloke in the back of the boat because, yeah. as you say, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, I think it's an important piece of film. I think it's. Um, is that is that part of that exhibition, Max? I've, I've not been to that exhibition for about twenty years. Um, I went uh, in there when I first went to the area, the one the next to the next to the hotel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, it is in there. Yeah, along with a piece of film that I shot actually of a seal at Fort Augustus. That's in there as well. Oh. Um, so I successfully filmed that. Anyway, um, yeah. So oh. so I, I I still do like the. Dinsdale film, although I do see that there is an argument against it, but um, I'm, yeah, but there's I'm, always going to be on there. So, what, so yeah. what are your feelings about what? What do you believe now? Obviously, you said earlier on when you first went to the area, you were looking for like dinosaurs and stuff. What What are you looking for now? Is, is your mind changed over the years, or as yeah, I, I reluctantly have to admit that we haven't got long necked plesiosaur dinosaurs swimming about in Loch Ness. That's Far, you're breaking true. people's hearts, Steve. I know, I know. Mine, <laughs> mine, the lifelong passion for me, you know, and it takes a lot to say, okay, I'm probably not going to spot a plesiosaur here. But what does to me tick, and in fact, it was Dick Rayner that put me onto this um, possible theory the thing called the Wells catfish. Now, they're okay. the they're the second biggest freshwater fish in the world, these things. They grow to four or five metres. Massive, great, big catfish. And we haven't got any records of it happening here in Loch Ness, but there is written account of, in two lakes in England, during the Victorian era, the landowners released Wells catfish into the lake for coarse fishing so that they could charge people to come and catch these big big catfish now we haven't got record of that happening here at Loch Ness but it could have happened here at Loch Ness because we've got various estates with fishing rights that may have thought well this is going to improve the fishing here if we put some catfish in here and they they fit the description to me they've got this upturned boat type back we only really get a sighting on a flat calm day when the roof of their world is silent. So mm-hmm. you imagine they feed on the other fish and the other fish live in the first meter of water mostly. So they're chasing mm-hmm. after them. They can't hear the waves on the roof of their world. Their back breaks the surface by accident. We get this brief sighting of this thing like a torpedo cutting through the bay and right. then it's away again. But So what do, you, what do you think the people are seeing that, that say they see a neck and all that stuff then? Uh, I, yeah, my catfish theory does not explain it all, I must admit. No. I struggle with a lot of the neck sightings. I think there's, I've observed here at Loch Ness. Is there ever, is there ever like a floating log or anything there, like anything in, in that water? I've never seen anything like it myself, but then I've, in yeah. comparison to you, I've hardly spent any time there, so. I've, I've seen many big lumps of driftwood floating about out there uh-huh. on a calm day i once couldn't understand what i was watching and it was it was right out in Dawes bay here but you could just see this black like an oil spill in a it looked like 
on a flat calm water like a cartoon speech bubble the shape yeah. of a bubble just a black something and it was just moving slowly in the, with the prevailing weather in this direction towards Dawes Beach and I was watching it for an hour or two as it came in binoculars thinking I do not know what that is and then as it got right up close to the beach, I walked along the beach to where it was, and it was this, like a speech, as I say, a speech bubble-sized shaped object, millions of pine needles all gathered together in this mat, this mat that was the size of, it must have been 50 feet round, a 50-foot round mat of close, incredible, maybe six inches thick as well in the water but all almost like magnetically joined together forming yeah. this bubble of floating you know i've only ever seen that once and it as it hit the shore it just concertinaed up on the shoreline and just slowly rolled up onto the beach and left its massive bank of pine needles and how that had formed on the loch, I don't know, and I've never seen it mm. since. So, you know, if if you saw that from a great distance on the other side of the loch, even that could have been a false alarm to somebody. You know, but yeah, the, absolutely. People do get genuine false alarms here. It's people are overly keen to see something, and the, when I say that there's um, there is evidence of auto suggestion going on as well regarding trying to spot Nessie um, forever and a day since um, the surgeon's photograph people have been reporting these nicks yeah. they hadn't before before the surgeon's photograph they did that photograph went around the world saying what looked in the picture to be about a four or five foot long neck that's what you should be expecting to see yeah, as it turned yeah. out it turned out the object was much smaller in that picture but it looked that sort of size and so from then on, occasionally, people do report necks. Now, all the necks from then on were in the right size area, four or five foot long necks, until in about 1994, the Loch Ness movie, the Ted Danson one, that, yeah. went, that went into the cinemas and people saw that and it was a hit and everything. And a lot of people came up here trying to spot Nessie as a result of that film. And... At the end of that film, Ted Danson and the little girl go down into this cavern underneath what's supposed to be Urquhart Castle because yeah. she can she can whistle and conjure up these monsters. And she whistles in this little cave. Out of this lagoon puddle in the cave emerge these two necks, which must be 30-foot-long necks. Yeah. And huge great thing, towering necks, which way out of proportion to what the evidence had always implied that there was in here and also way out of proportion to what the eyewitnesses had ever seen in here but when that film got released over the next six months i must have had half a dozen people that came around here and said i've just seen something along the last side it was a 30 foot long neck <laughs> one one bloke brought me a photograph of the 30 foot long neck that he'd seen in urquhart bay it was the mast of a yacht <laughs> <laughs> so so if you tell them, that. if you tell people what they should see they will go away and they will see it so if you yeah. say this animal's got a neck people will, will report seeing necks and i same with land sightings i struggle with land sightings as well yeah uh, i'm not saying i'm right it's just my opinion <laughs> and yeah I remember yeah. seeing that film and um, I get quite annoyed looking at it because I know the area and I'm like, that's not Loch Ness. That wasn't filmed at Loch Ness. What are they doing? That's, that was a different castle down the road. And um, well, some of it, some of it was filmed on that beach you're on though, isn't it? Was I right about that? Third of the, yeah, a third of the film was filmed here on Dawes Beach and they, t they turned up, the location manager and others turned up for weeks, be months beforehand, location shooting, trying to pick the right spot and so I got talking to them and they uh, eventually they came back and they said, yeah, we're going to be here next week and we're bringing in the catering wagon and the 
two big trailers for Ted Danson and Jolie Richardson. And yeah. uh, that's all go in this bottom car park here. And all the, we're going to have several big lorries full of all the props. <laughs> so uh, we sort of, it'd be ideal if you move your van out. Will you, will you, is that okay for you? That you just go, don't park in here for a bit. And of course I said, yeah, all right. And I, oh, because you were still mobile then, right? I was still mobile then, but I had absolutely yeah. no intention of being told to move out by no. Hollywood. So, <laughs> unluckily for them, when they did turn up with all the lorries and stuff, I was still sat here. So they had to work around that, and so I ended up sitting in a Hollywood film lot for about two months. I'd, yeah. I'd queue up. I'd queue up at the catering wagon with the rest of them. And they, <laughs> Why not? Absolutely, it was great. It was an absolute. And so, yeah, this beach, they filmed on this beach for about three months and it was fantastic. The whole, just watching the whole operation of how they went about doing that, you know. Yeah. yeah. I've got a um, lot of fun. Films yeah, like I bet. So I was going to ask, because like, I have to wrap this up pretty soon. Uh, cool. Is there any regrets? There's no regrets. Absolutely not. No. I, not ever, not ever once one day laying there with a cold in the freezing winter. Thinking. Oh, the the free the freedom I have to follow the um, ambitions of a seven year old boy to do what I love doing with my life, and you know, a, part, a large part of the message that I do contain, and occasionally it gets filtered out in interviews that I do with media, is okay. I'm fasc- I'm fascinated by this mystery. And, many other people are but it's a universal message to anybody in the world don't if you've got a passion to do something i'm not saying to everyone get in a van and come and find the loch ness monster with me this is great i'm saying if you've got a passion to do anything follow your dreams make your life the adventure you want it to be and you'll never have any regrets that's what you know i'm living proof that 30 years 29 years down the road it if anything, I'm even more more excited about the adventures that go on here. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. I'm actually, you know, uh, ironically, all the um, COVID nineteen stuff that's going on now and the massive shutdown, it's resulted in I haven't seen a boat on Loch Ness for the last week. The Jacobite cruise boats yeah. have all stopped. None of the Cali cruisers that are normally out. There's none of those out. I think I saw one little tiny fishing boat yesterday and I'm actually looking forward in a way to this summer when there is precious little activity on this water and also precious little tourist distractions because because I'm very well known to be spending all my life dedicated to solving this and I don't I'm not knocking this this is how I support myself a lot of people do come and ask me questions in the summer. So actually getting down to some staring at the water or floating about in boats looking for Nessie sort of has to go on the back burner in order to earn the crust to generate yeah. enough money to keep going. But this coming summer, I've, I almost feel like I've got a summer off because the tourists aren't going to be here. The boats aren't going to be here. So I've, I've recently bought this beautiful underwater um, it's like a drone but it works underwater on a 25 meter long tether and a 4k camera on the front of it a few lights and so i'm looking forward to just floating yeah. about having a look on the bottom seeing what looking for a carcass that sort of thing um, right okay oh, i'll see yeah yeah so so as regarding the future so you've got no plans to to not do this anymore to look like buy yourself a house in Inverness or something and <laughs> semi, semi-retire. That would be a step backwards. Uh, yeah. And also, right, I've got you. Yeah. Yeah. I, to retire, I mean, the stress free life that I live, you know, any stress is of my own making and my own, you know, if, if I want to, but I don't have many stresses. I don't have bills to pay. I don't have, um, a nine to five to maintain. I don't have wife and kids. I've got a long-term partner. She's, we don't have kids. We've been together for about 15 years, I think. And yeah, 
I don't, okay, not in the van. Uh, some, a, lot, a lot of the time, not all the time. Really? She's got, yeah, she's got a house in town. Um, so in the winter, I might stay there a couple of nights a week. But in the summer, she stays here four nights a week. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's ideal, really. Ah, okay. It's ideal um, for me. Yeah, so that was, yeah, so that's good. Thanks for coming on, Steve. That was a really, really good interview. Thank you very much. Uh, just one more thing. So you're going to have to self-isolate. <laughs> you're going to have to self-isolate now with this COVID-19. You think you're going to manage okay because you've been doing it for 29 years. <laughs> just another day at the office, really, isn't it? Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, yeah no, I'd, 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 we'll get through it. We'll get through it. It's yeah. uh, uncharted. Oh, and uh, one of the things I've always said about this life of doing what I do, apart from this thing that's come over the horizon, the unexpected is what I cherish, the, the different adventures that just keep finding me here, sat on the side of Loch Ness, the different. Yeah. And this is pretty much the first negative one that's come over the horizon. But, you know, I remember when this beach got shut down because of the foot and mouth. We were shut right. down for six years. Nobody was allowed to walk on Dawes Beach. But now, yeah, the memory... I was, I, was, I was actually there for, during the foot and mouth. We was driving through lots of disinfectant and stuff every time we got to somewhere. And, yeah, I remember. What a catastrophe that was at the time. The piles yeah. of burning cows around the countryside. Yeah, that's right. And yet now, we look back on that as a vaguely remembered distant past. And yeah. this situation we're going through now there'll come a time when we will again look back on this oh, as so. a bad time that we will eventually see the other side of. So, yeah. Is there any yeah. toilet paper there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is. Yeah. I'll be careful what you say because everybody will be heading up there to get some. No, we've completely run out. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thanks a lot for coming on, Steve. Pleasure, Matt. Pleasure. Thanks, Pleasure. mate. Cheers. Yeah. Stay well. You too, mate. So Steve fell from there. He's got no intentions of retiring or giving up, has he? He'll be there for the duration, by the looks of things. Trying to solve this mystery. Thanks a lot, Steve, for coming on. And uh, I hope everybody enjoyed that. And I hope that wherever you are you're okay at the moment with this virus and everything that's going on and uh stop buying bog rolls everybody seriously it's ridiculous thanks <laughs> i'll see you next time on Matt chat